like to thank you for joining us for The Grace Between Us. And today, unfortunately, it's a very difficult topic that we're going to tackle, uh, mm-hmm. mostly because of the events of this past weekend, uh, Friday or Saturday night through Sunday morning. Yeah. Uh, there were two major events. Uh, I guess before we get started, I'm Pastor Nathan Hurst, and this is... Lori. Lori, yes, <laughs> and my wife always with me by my side. Uh, but two major events this weekend, two shootings. Uh, the first one Horrific in El Paso. Horrific events. Yes. Yes. Horrific, horrific events. The first one in El Paso, Mm -hmm. and then the second in Dayton, Dayton, Ohio. Ohio. And uh, we're familiar with the Ohio uh, region, obviously, because we went to school in Columbus, Mm -hmm. uh, drove around and through and passed Dayton many, many Many, times, many many times, times, more times than I can count. Mm -hmm. Uh, So our hearts definitely go out to those that were affected. And then those in El Paso, uh, you know, there's there's something wrong in our culture. Yeah, it's, it's a problem. You know, to think that killing people is going to help situations Mm -hmm. is just mind-boggling to me it just makes my head hurt because I don't understand it makes no sense you're hurting people that is not going to help any situation I don't care how you try to drum it up in your head yeah it's it's unfortunate you know we we will see this heavily politicized yeah it's already started on on social media Mm -hmm. you know this group calling this group this name and this group calling you know actions against the other group and they'll start to blame folks and we'll get into scapegoating here in just a minute um and and how much of that is is uncalled for not only uncalled for it's it's not the gospel like it's Mm -hmm. not allowed in the gospel uh but the big thing we want to talk about today is america uh, specifically the church christians and guns You know, guns are real. They're real part of American culture. And some of you might not like that. Some of you might think they shouldn't be a part of American culture at all. Well, they are part of American culture. Mm -hmm. Just quick stats on America and guns. Uh, We have 27 million. I'm sorry, 270. That number is always big to me. 270 million guns in the United States. That's a lot. That's a lot of guns. A lot, a lot, a lot. Well, let's break it down a little bit. That means... America owns 40% of all the guns in the entire world. One huh. nation, 40% of all the private-owned firearms in the world. Uh, the third step there is there's 120.5 guns per 100 people. So this country could be armed to the teeth, literally armed to the teeth if we wanted to be. Um, and, and you can see the dispersion there of, of the guns. Mm-hmm. So we are a nation that has a prevalent number of guns. Right. It is something we have to talk about. This is something that actually when we made as a suggestion was something people wanted to hear about. And because of the events of those last weekend, you know, she and I were talking, well, maybe we need to cover it. Um, yeah, it's hard to know where to go from here because you don't want to, there's a couple of things we don't want to do. I don't want to mislead someone. So first we're going to give our background about guns and then we'll get into it. Obviously, please understand, as we said in the outset, any tragedy that happens with a firearm is a tragedy. Oh, it's terrifying. It, it's ter- terrifying to think about that it could happen to our family or to our kids mm-hmm. or in a scenario where we would be involved. Right. It's terrible to think that someone might even be forced to make a choice to pull a trigger for some reason or another, whether you're an officer or maybe you're a first responder or maybe you're someone who's armed and you're defending someone. Mm-hmm. To even think that you could possibly make that choice to pull that trigger is a right. terrifying, sobering thought. I grew up in a household with guns. I had a ton of guns in my house. Mm. My parents, uh, well, my not my parents. My dad was into shooting sports early, early on. Uh, My grandfather's always been into guns. I was taught gun safety very early. I think I had my first BB gun by the time I was ten years old. Didn't you have a potato gun? I did have a potato gun after a while. That's it's not a real gun. It's like a big piece of PVC. You shove a potato down. Yeah, we, I mean, yeah, I messed around with it <laughs> as a kid. Um, but, you know, you shove a potato down a piece of PVC pipe and blow it out the other end. It's not really mm-hmm. a, it's not, I mean, it could hurt somebody, but it's not really a firearm. But, you know, we were around, I was around firearms growing up. Now, Lori didn't grow up that way. Well, I mean, I think they were in our home, but I honestly didn't touch them, wasn't around them, mm-hmm. didn't use them in any way, shape, or form. And so, you know, Just in all honesty, it's not something that I'm comfortable with or familiar with Mm -hmm. to handle. So it's like, hmm, I don't know what I don't know. So I'm going to let it be. Yeah. And and from my, and kind of my perspective, uh, you know, some of my earliest memories, maybe not earliest memories, some of my closest memories with my grandfather, my father are, are hunting, walking in a, in an open field with a dog in front of us and, and, you know, chasing down some upland game. And we did that a lot. We, I did that a lot as a kid. You know, I can remember coming home for Thanksgiving or different breaks in college yeah. and knowing that I was going to 
go hunting. Yeah. He's going to put on the put on the the right clothes and and go grab a shotgun and you know go find some birds. And that's what we did. That was part of our pastime. Uh, you know, so I I remember as a kid learning how to make shotgun shells in the basement. You know, with the press. Oh, weird. And you have this big <laughs> machine that divvies out all the ingredients needed, and the loads have to have a certain you know gram weight of this and that. And you know, I learned how to do that as a kid. Uh, and, and there was nothing to it. In fact, my dad shot so much that he would it made it part of my, my job duties in the house to make shotgun shells, to reload shotgun shells <laughs> so that he could have more shells to practice with okay. throughout the week. I, I mean, I remember growing up at the shooting range with men with guns everywhere. I never felt unsafe. Mm -hmm. I never felt as if any of these men had any malice in their heart that they would ever do anything wrong with a firearm. I never felt as though this was a place where uh, I should be uneasy mm -hmm. or I never felt that the guns were anything to be, uh, to be nothing less than respected, right. right? The firearms there, it is a lethal weapon and you respect it as such. But if you use it appropriately, then you know, you right. can have fun with it. You could shoot sure. some targets out of the sky, which is what my dad did a lot of in shooting skeets competitively, yeah. uh, for, you know, for most of my life. And so for me, this, this issue is, is it's different, right? Because then as a pastor, you see the hurt, mm -hmm. you see the life that's taken because of a firearm. Mm -hmm. You see all of these issues that happen because people misuse firearms and, right. and it's, it's a scary thought. Well, and you the, know? when you hear people talk about firearms, it's always in a negative context in the news for sure. Yeah. Generally yeah. you're, you don't, you don't really hear about all of the, the good things that happen, the camaraderie. You don't hear about the shooting sports and yeah, you don't hear about those things. It's generally in a negative sense. And so we get an idea that anything that happens around firearms is negative. Well, and I mean, they, they can be deadly. They, they are, you know, they are deadly. And it's something to talk about, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's where the media brings that up and really makes us start thinking about that. And then that's the negative connotation we all have in our mind. Yeah. You know, I, we've got some notes here today and I, I think, I don't, I, I think we're going to focus a little, and again, this is a touchy subject for a it lot is. of people. So I, I don't want to, I don't want to mistreat it. It's probably something we're going to have to come back to from time to time. It's not my favorite subject. It's not my favorite <laughs> subject either, to be honest. It's not a subject that I want to throw out there and be like, no. guns, guns, guns. We all need it, guns. You know, just, that's. It's a heart issue. Mm -hmm. You know, I was just talking about it with someone today. You know, what it, what's going to fix this? Mm -hmm. You know, why do people think that somehow, you know, going into a Walmart and shooting people is going to fix anything? How is this going to help a situation? What are you going to bring to light that people aren't going to already know? Mm -hmm. You know, and it all comes down to people need Jesus. I mean, it's, I know people are like, oh, that's super simple. No, it's truly <laughs> the truth. You know, they need Jesus. The and you're know, looking for um, their passion their value and everything but Jesus mm -hmm. and when you find your value in Jesus then you're going to value the life and people yes and you're going to value your life and then because you value your life you're going to value others you know we talked about it in service today when I mentioned uh in the beginning of the service this issue of, of these two shootings the Imago Dei the image of God that's stamped on every person every person carries with it the Imago Dei with him or her the Imago Dei mm -hmm. and that's children in the womb that need to be protected. Sorry if you don't like that. Mm -hmm. And that's live human beings, breathing human beings on their own, sentient beings outside of the womb. That's them as well. They need to be protected. They need to, we need to establish the Imago Dei in every single person in the womb, outside the womb, a young, old, white, black. It doesn't matter, you know, where you come from. It doesn't matter if you're a naturally born citizen or a refugee. Everyone has that Imago Dei stamped on them. And that's how we treat people with the image of God on them. Uh, you know, it's funny. People ask all the time, like, what would Jesus do? Would Jesus be okay with firearms? Is Jesus a gun toting, Bible thumping, you know, uh, evangelical? He didn't have a gun. He didn't, he didn't have a gun. You're right. He didn't have a gun. <laughs> it's funny though, but you, you have a, we have a concept in Luke, in Luke 11 and 12, it says, uh, these are Jesus's words. When a strong man, fully armed guards his own house, his possessions are 
are undisturbed. Okay, so this is the words of Jesus, and he's not really talking about guns, and he's really not even talking in this passage about defense, but he gives the illustration of the idea of a strong man, fully armed, fully prepared, and that he can defend his own house and even his possessions. He, they're, they're not disturbed. You know, we get another example of Jesus talking on these lines in Matthew 12 and 29, where he says, can anyone enter the house of a strong man uh, and carry off his property unless that man first be tied? up uh, and then then his house can be plundered so this idea Jesus is saying that if you have the strength of defense you will defend yourself yeah. he doesn't he doesn't say it's wrong now again this isn't the context he's using and I don't want to get any weird emails like that's not exactly what Jesus was talking about I understand the context but he what he didn't say is very is very much as important as what he did say he didn't say we can't defend ourselves. Mm -hmm. Now, he did say there was much persecution that comes with the gospel. There's a difference between preaching the gospel and being persecuted and someone coming against your life and your livelihood yeah. and your family's life for malicious need, or mm -hmm. for malicious reasons that are beyond the gospel. Yeah. Right? It's one thing if someone persecutes you because you're preaching Jesus. It's another thing because someone comes in your house wants to steal what you have. Mm -hmm. And it seems as though Jesus was using this terminology to say, mm -hmm. yeah, defense is one thing. So would Jesus carry a gun? I don't, I'm don't. i not saying he would. I'm not saying he wouldn't. I don't think Jesus would have a need to carry a gun. Right. But I also don't think he would say, listen, you, you can't have firearms to defend yourself. Now, Romans chapter 12 and verse 17 specifically, and then you can read on through verse 21. Jesus says, don't repay evil for evil. Right. Repay no one evil for evil. So the fact that we have a firearm is not about vengeance, though. Mm -hmm. It's not about enacting vengeance, enacting this idea that I'm going to go after the one who wronged me. Mm -hmm. There's a huge difference. Again, protecting people as opposed to going after someone yeah. who's wronged you. And the I, Bible specifically says you shouldn't do that very clearly. Yeah. You know? But I think when we talk about firearms, there's a lot of people who own them, mm -hmm. not because of sport. Like, I grew up with firearms for sport. No one ever thought of using a firearm in a way that would hurt anyone. No, we never talked about it even as a young kid if I made a stupid joke about it my my grandfather and my dad made sure to put that thought out of my head that's a dumb idea you don't talk like that so we didn't use firearms in that way however there are people who buy them like if I ever need to I can enact vengeance mm. and that's it's not, not godly it's, it's, it's not, not okay. funny it's not okay if that's the reason you own a firearm you shouldn't you have it. it yeah if you own a firearm because you're hoping for the day that you get to squeeze off around and see what it's like to injure somebody or kill someone you shouldn't own the gun mm -mm. that gun should be you that you should own it now I'm not advocating for some kind of weird mental test to find out who's you know I, I think that can get taken too far as well but I am saying that you got to check your own heart. Yeah. And if you don't have the right perspective, if you don't have the right reason for owning the firearm, you shouldn't own it. Yeah. You shouldn't. I don't care. And, and listen, I know enough about firearms to know if you want to classify, you know, a scary black gun as an assault weapon, eventually you are going to classify anything and everything and anything by some suspicious means. And that's, that's, I'm not saying that's a slippery slope like the NRA says. I'm just saying it's not about the type of weapon. It's about the heart of the individual. Right. That's really the issue. Definitely. We have, we get dead examples of people using knives uh, to, to, to kill people or bombs or whatever. And they used, you know, we have earliest stories where in the Bible, where someone used a, a rock to rock, kill his brother. Right. My teenagers I know. Right. Yeah. So it's not like people won't murder if they have the impression to do that. And so I they, think we, they'll use anything that they, they will they use. They will use anything, but the Bible's definitive, right? Jesus saying that we have a reason. And then you can look at even the words of Paul saying, you know, you have to think about leaving a legacy mm -hmm. for your children's children. Well, you can't do that if you can't defend the legacy you're leaving. Right. But on the other hand is Matthew, you know, 10 and verse 28 says that this isn't where our salvation is. This isn't where our salvation lies. Right. It says, do not fear those who would kill the body and who can't kill the soul. Again, words of Jesus. Rather, fear him who can destroy the body and the soul, both in hell. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, salvation doesn't come by way of a gun, though. No. America's not saved because of her firearms. Not at all. We're not, we're not more protected as a nation because of our firearms. Here's something that, again, if you're, if you're really heavy into guns, you might not like this. Mm. But our government right now 
could submit most people under its thumb without firing a shot. Cut off your telecommunication, cut off your water, cut off your sewer, cut off the roads and streets and all you're sequestered to is your little home. Most Americans would give up and give in to the government and wave their little white flag instantly. Now, I'm not saying there wouldn't be a handful of those who would might maybe take to the streets and take up arms against the government. But we have the world's best military, most funded military, and we somehow think that we are going to curb that with your little, you know, nine millimeter in your pocket or in your house somewhere. It's not going to happen. It's the best military on the planet. They know what they're doing. If they want to enforce their will on the American people, they can. Mm -hmm. However, however, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't have a right and responsibility to protect ourselves or to protect others who are weak. Right. So I'm not defending right there. I hope everyone understands. I'm not defending and saying you have to have a firearm. I'm Mm -hmm. saying there's reason to say that God gives us a responsible way to own a firearm. What are you owning it for? Yeah, I think it all comes down to, you know, like we talked about before, the heart of the individual. Mm -hmm. I mean, we honestly need to pray for our nation. Yes. We need to pray. I mean, where people are going out and harming people, normal, good people for Mm -hmm. no good reason. And so, I mean, there's a heart issue that needs to be addressed in our country. You know, Mm -hmm. we have to get to that point. Eliminating guns isn't the solve for all of this either. Individuals who want to get a gun are going to find a gun. And so we really need to pray for the hearts and the souls of the people, because if we, if the hearts and the souls of the people change, then we will see the change that we all so desperately want to see. Well, and and we have that definitively in scripture. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, I will hear them. I will heal their land. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know that we have this admonishment from God, humble yourself, pray, seek his face Mm -hmm. and he will heal our land. You know, I put up something today on Facebook, maybe on Twitter as well, um, uh, from Ed Stenser. And, and this kind of lines up with what I want to talk about I with guns this. and some yeah. other things. And Ed Stenser said that racism, white nationalism, and white supremacy all make no sense if you're a Christian. Mm. He said Christians literally worship a dark-skinned Jewish savior from the Middle East. That's right. Not only is racism sinful... It is remarkably stupid for anyone who identifies as a Christian. I love those words from Ed Stenser because it's true, right? We serve a Jewish Jesus. We serve a Middle Eastern guy, Mm -hmm. right? Brown skinned Middle Eastern guy. So I don't care what the motives are for someone to impose this ill will. Mm -hmm. There's no reason for it. And the fact is something I want to talk about today when it talks about guns, uh, we we can talk about more the the, the nuances of guns and things later and gun culture and whatever. And and, and I've lived it all. I've been a part of it all, been to the NRA conventions. I've seen it all. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mostly we're talking about good hearted American people who have a pastime that they love and they think of the defense of self and the defense of others, their Mm -hmm. firearms. 99.99% of these people are never going to do anything anyone, any harm. But what we've done, we we've learned to scapegoat and scapegoat is a word that comes from the Bible. I think most people aren't aware of that, but it comes straight from the Bible. But this idea of scapegoating is, well, if you're unfamiliar, Leviticus are the instructions for scapegoating in Leviticus 16. Leviticus 16 literally talks about how the priest is going to take this goat Particularly, the one, there's two goats made for an atonement. The one is killed and the blood is led, and that is for the atonement. The other is the scapegoat, mm-hmm. where the goat is then pulled into the, the, the Jewish rabbi. And there, he literally lays his head, head to head with this goat, and pulls it and confesses the sins of a nation onto mm-hmm. this goat. And then the goat is led out into the wilderness by a very responsible man, never to come back to the camp. And so it's the scapegoat. It's an escape for the sins of the people and they're led astray or the the sins are led away from the group, never, ever to be remembered again. So then we get this idea in John, go ahead and read it in John chapter one and verse 29. It says, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Okay. That's a very important scripture here because this is John admonishing Jesus as the lamb who is going to eradicate the idea of sin. However, in this scripture, John, particularly John chapter one and verse 29, it's singular. It doesn't say the sins of the world. Mm. It says the sin of the world. There's patterns that we see. Jesus became the one who was sinned against to reveal the hidden nature of scapegoating in our culture. 
You can look at John chapter 16, verse 8 through 11 for that reference, or you can look at Romans uh, chapter 8 and verse 3 for that reference as well. But the idea is that Jesus became the scapegoat, so he stopped scapegoating. So what does that mean? That means when we say they're the problem. Yep. That group is the problem. Mm -hmm. Most of these shootings that unfortunately happen with firearms, and we could argue, you know, which firearms should be legal and which one shouldn't be. That's not the reason for our discussion today. But 90% of the time, it's about scapegoating. Yeah. Placing blame on someone else. That's right. And that's a hard one. Nobody wants to hear that. You know, you don't want to think on those lines. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm not doing this. But, Mm -hmm. you know, we ultimately... It comes down to that. Well, and, and so many of us are so good at it, oh, right? Yeah. Especially through social media. Mm-hmm. It was, <laughs> for some of you, it was Obama's fault. Everything was Obama's fault. We get Obama out of office. Life is going to be good again. That's yeah. scapegoating. For some of you right now, it's Trump's fault. Yeah. Everything Trump does is wrong. He's this, he's that. And as soon as we get Trump out of the way, life will be good again. Mm-hmm. For some folks, it was immigrants. Immigrants are the problem. They're the total problem. It's not that they don't believe in laws and people should come here legally. That's not the point. The right. point is people at some point thought they're going to steal all of the good jobs and they're going to do this and they're going to do that. And we've scapegoated a group of people. Mm-hmm. For some of you, it's the corporations. Mm-hmm. The corporations, man, they're the problem. If we get rid of yeah. the corporations, we get rid of those corporate fat cats. If we tax them more. Yeah. Every time we do that, that is a non-Christian thing to do. Ouch. That is what Jesus died, bled and died for us to stop to doing. Stop doing, yeah. Literally, Jesus in this scapegoat mentality is saying, I'm the scapegoat. Yep. You want to place blame, place it on me, mm-hmm. and then go to self. Yeah. Takes away the sin of the world, takes the sin he's been sinned upon, mm-hmm. disperses that through the cross. It just eliminates it through the cross. It totally vanishes through the cross. And then says, okay, I've made the world. I'm setting the world to right. Right. But we can't do that if we keep placing Blame. someone else, yes, in that scapegoat position and not Jesus. That's hard. It's very hard. A lot hard. of people just don't even, can't even get past that. That's no. the, what they know. They've learned that and they continually go into that pattern well, we no hear, matter what situation they're in. We hear rhetoric. We hear mm-hmm. rhetoric. Right now we're going to hear the guns are the problem. Or we're going to hear one party is the problem mm-hmm. or one issue is the problem. And, and it really, honestly, I, uh, from uh, my perspective, I think a lot of times I like to just throw out there, like, you know, you, if you believe this, you can't say this. Or if you believe that, then you can't say this. And, and unfortunately, it's, it's constant, right? It's mm-hmm. constant in our media cycle right now. And we are never going to heal as a nation as long as that is the mm-hmm. mode in which we operate. Yeah. We're never going to heal as a nation. And Christians and guns is always going to be this, this issue that kind of hangs around the culture sphere mm-hmm. as a scapegoat idea. Yeah. If we just get rid of all these stupid Christians and their fundamental beliefs, if we just get rid of all of these guns, if we just get rid of this, if we get rid of that, if we get rid of all the liberals, if we get rid of all the progressives, Gosh. if we finally get rid of every single abortion clinic, life will be good. The problem is the sinful nature of man is the issue. Right. So when it comes to the issue of guns, we can't scapegoat an inan- inanimate object no. like a gun. No. We can't we place to, all the blame on it. No. We have to come back to the idea it doesn't matter if there's... 270 million guns in this country. Mm -hmm. There could be 270 million guns in this country and no mass shootings. Yeah, absolutely. There could be. Yep, there could. There could be. Will that happen? I don't know. Men are pretty evil, stinking evil at times. Mm -hmm. I don't know. We could be the country that lowers some of these crime rates, but it's not going to happen when we keep scapegoating people. Right. When we keep saying they're the problem over there. Nothing changes. Nothing changes. And unfortunately, that's the dialogue that we're in now to where if people even click on and watch this video, many of them are going to say, I didn't hear what I want. I didn't hear what I wanted to hear. So you, you two people are crazy. (laughs) You didn't deal with the issue the way I wanted you to deal with it. So you're the problem. You didn't introduce new legislation that Congress should pass. You didn't introduce a way and a means to, to silence the argument from the liberals, the progressives, because that's not really what this is about. We have to have conversations though. We have to hear people out. We have to come to you know, an understanding agreements of how we can move forward mm-hmm. instead of blaming all the time. It's That's not right. making any progress. The change is not happening. No, change isn't happening right now in our culture on this issue. Well, I should take that back. Actually, change is happening. Violent crimes and even even the idea of, of people killed by firearms is coming down. Like yeah. things are getting better. The news cycle at times doesn't make us want to feel that way. But things are getting better. They are coming down. Violent crimes mm-hmm. and, and murders through guns and things are getting better. Now, you could say that they're happening at this rate of mass shootings is much higher. And that 
that is true. That is true. So we're kind of trading one for another, but overall the death toll by by guns is coming down. And and you know, violent crime in general is coming down, which is a good thing. It's Very something good. we should celebrate as a nation, mm-hmm. something we should celebrate all throughout the world because it's happening all the, all around the world as well. Mm-hmm. But man, ugh, we can get so tied to this idea of our cultural understanding of guns. Yeah. And depending on how you grew up, you might see it one way or another. You might see them totally as bad and scary and evil. Yeah. I understand that because they've been used that way. It's hard. That's right. You might see them as nothing yeah, more than a tool. has a different perspective. Yeah. Different experiences that have changed their view. Yeah, it's know? true. I see them as nothing more than a tool. Mm-hmm. A tool to be used in an appropriate way and it gets the job done when you need it to get done. But and I look at it like, I don't want to touch that. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yeah. It's true. And, you know, some of those things, we're going to have to teach our boys how to manage mm-hmm. things well. Because, God forbid, we don't teach her well and they come across a firearm at a friend's house and don't know what to do about it. Or don't know what responsible handling is of a firearm and get themselves in trouble or allow someone else to get them in trouble. We want to teach our children the right thing to do. And I'm not, I don't want you to be a paranoid parent no. where you're buying Kevlar book bags for your kids. I think that's scary, scary stuff. That, well, that shouldn't happen. The good thing is technology is improving at such a rate that very soon there'll be biometrics on guns and you won't be able to fire the gun unless you're tagged to it mm. and the biometrics there. And some of those things are going to be great advancements in firearm safety in the future. They're not here today, but they're coming down, down the path. So I think we have a good reason to be hopeful. Yeah. Well, obviously our hope in Jesus, but I think we also need to kind of pull back a little bit and understand guns, they're not the central problem. They are contributing to the problem. Mm -hmm. And maybe we need different legislation. I'm not arguing that. We have legislation right now. You can't own an Abrams tank. I can't own a nuclear weapon. So there's reasonable extents to which people will go to limit firearm access to some extent, Mm -hmm. right? There's, there's weapons I can't own fully automatic, uh, fully automatic, uh, firing weapons. I can't own, Mm -hmm. you know, and if you don't know the law very well, you should probably get educated in that. And I would also encourage everyone who's terrified to buy a gun and thinks it's incredibly too easy to get one, go buy a gun. Go buy, go through the process. Don't pay for it when the time comes. Just go through the process of buying a gun. Put it in the down down payment and see how hard it is to actually purchase a gun. It's not as easy as people think. But it but doesn't mean people don't do stupid things with it. Yeah. So as Christians, what should we do? We should stop scapegoating. Number one, we should stop scapegoating. Number two, we shouldn't be scared to want to defend innocence. Yes. Even if that comes by way of a firearm. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying you should in every case, be that person that's ready to pull the trigger either. That's not the point. That should be something that weighs so heavily on anyone that would have to do that from a police officer to a, to someone in the military, uh, to someone who's just defending someone on their block or their street. That should be incredibly hard for us to, to even process through. Mm -hmm. However, we should think about what it is to defend innocent people. And if God's pulling on your heart to arm yourself to do that, then that's between you and him. Mm -hmm. And if he's telling you, no, that's okay too. Like you have to live with your own conscience but we also have to understand that firearms don't save us no firearms are not our ultimate security Mm-mm. i can go to bed peacefully at night knowing that there is no firearm on the planet that is ultimately going to save me only jesus is going to do that mm-hmm. it is a tool and it has an end usage and yeah. that is it yep that's like sleeping with a hammer under your pillow thinking it's going to build you a house it or won't I, oh <laughs> yeah, it doesn't work that way. But we need to come to a place where we understand what firearms are and how they can even fit in this scope of Christianity. It's not that they don't have a place. Mm-hmm. It's that they have a proper place. But we have to first recognize the value of life. Mm-hmm. Life has to matter. Listen, I put something up on social media not too long ago, yeah. disagreeing with some people about an issue. And I since have taken the post down because it got so crazy. But literally folks said, I have no value and neither does my family yeah. like not just me who posted it but my sons who they don't even know my wife who they don't even know if she even agrees with me she could be totally she could be totally in disagreement with me on that post yet they automatically assumed she agreed with me and because of that she has no value as a human person that's disgusting mm-hmm. we have got to come back to a new place of decorum where we understand how to treat each other yeah it's, it's sad. It's sad. Listen, we Christians... We could talk about this all night. That's right. That's right. We could. And, and you know what? We're not going to go on too long. I think it's, we've had enough here. But Christians and guns, man, that's, a, that's an individual decision. Mm-hmm. But don't knock somebody because they choose it differently. Yeah. 
Don't knock someone because they choose a different decision. Paul said we work out our salvation through fear and trembling. Yes. You have to work out your own salvation. Mm -hmm. If that involves a firearm, it does. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But work that out through fear and trembling of your own self. I have some very, very, very big issues in my head of how I think about firearms. And I would never impose that on another, on another person. Right. Never in my life. Because that's my experience. Right. I wouldn't impose it on her either. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's our thoughts today for the grace between us if you want to follow us on instagram or any of the other socials at the grace between us mm -hmm. yep we're praying for families in el paso mm -hmm. that have been affected and in dayton our hearts are broken in fact loss. we're gonna have um this is we're filming this on uh sunday night and on a monday night the following monday um which i think is the fifth of all of, of august august we're going to have a sponsor a prayer vigil prayer community prayer at our at our okay. church and many other churches and pastors are getting together to pray yep. uh, we need to seek god's face for answers for this issue yep. and for these issues in our culture mm -hmm. you know i i don't want to be the guy that blames video games or that blames this or blames that there's so many other things going so on much. here and and it all is a combination that has created a powder keg and we've got to learn to deal with it as a culture. Yeah. So we're going to get together and pray about so it. So be praying with us for those individuals. That's you right. Know, it's just terrible, terrible things that have happened. And yeah, and don't just pray one day and forget it. No. Please put them on your prayer list and pray continually. These families yeah. need to be uplifted. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and we hope that it doesn't turn their heart cold and callous towards God. That they understand they have a God who loves them and cares for them, who watches over them, even in the most troubling situations. Mm -hmm. the, the reality is that there's real evil in the world. Right. And our job is to overcome evil with the gospel. Right. The Bible is really clear that the gates of hell will not stand against God's church. Yeah. But the church has got to arise and be the church that God called right. us to be. So we hope you, again, we, we hope you going. enjoyed this. But... We'll, ta we'll tackle guns again later. We just thought it was a good idea to maybe cut our teeth on this yeah. issue here uh, with, with what has happened over the last weekend and just understand it is a tragedy and mourn with those who are mourning. Do your best to sympathize with those who are hurting. Mm -hmm. Don't place blame. This is not the time for that. No. It's time to mourn. It's time to take on the weight of the burden that these people are carrying and understand what it is to hurt like that. And trust me, it's terrifying to bury someone that you love. Mm -hmm. I've been to too many grave sites for too many different reasons as a pastor. It is an unbelievable burden to watch people and to be with people as they bury someone they love. So pray for those. Yep. We will see you next time. Mm -hmm.